In the previous topic, we got to error detection and error correction. We have frames we send across a link. The frame is made up of some payload, the actual data, and, and some header, or maybe trailer, where the header and trailer are some extra information that support the data transfer. And we'll see some more examples of what the header and trailer look like as we go through different protocols. So we send a frame across a link. One of the issues we have is, what if we have errors in that link? It means what's received is not the same as what was transmitted. And we need to first detect those errors, and then, if possible, correct the errors. So we saw, say, parity bit as an error detection scheme, and this Hamming code-based error correction, forward error correction. We're going to look at some other ways to correct and detect errors. And the ways that they detect and correct errors uh, use similar techniques to another purpose of what we'll go through today is flow control. So the techniques for correcting and detecting errors are classified as automatic repeat request schemes or ARQ schemes. We'll cover them eventually, but it turns out they're very similar to the schemes that are performed for flow control. So today we'll introduce what is flow control and some of the basics of the protocols for flow control and ARQ. First, we need to say, well, what do we mean by a protocol? And how can we try to analyze and understand what a protocol will do and how it, will it perform? How can we analyze it? Quite simply, we can say a communication protocol, it's a set of rules. A rules that the, the computing devices which are trying to communicate must follow. There may be two entities involved, or in some cases more than two involved. But the most of the examples we'll see, there are two entities. A sending to B, for example. What rules do they follow such that they can communicate correctly and efficiently? So a protocol will define the rules that include define the, the entities involved. For example, give them names like a client and a server. A web browser communicates to a web server using a protocol called HTTP. HTTP defines the, the involvement of those entities. They send messages. Generally, we call them messages. We've been speaking about frames. But the entities send messages to each other. What types of messages and what are the structure of those messages? For example, a protocol may say that Computer A sends a data message to computer B, and computer B must respond with an acknowledgement message saying, I've received your data. So we'll see an example where protocols may use, say, two types of messages, a data message and an ACK or acknowledgement message. In addition, the formats of those messages are defined. The formats really mean uh, the structure of the frame. How big is the header? what fields are included in the header, and uh, how big the payload may be, and if there's a trailer. So that must be defined in advance. And sometimes there are assumptions about, well, if we send these messages, what do we assume about the underlying mechanisms? Are there any errors in the link? Do we need to deal with those errors? And protocols are designed by people, and usually they become a standard. So there's a standard for uh, data communications via wireless LANs. So from my laptop to the wireless access point, the frames that my laptop sends to the access point, the structure of those frames, when I can send, how often, is defined in a protocol. And that protocol is inside uh, what's called the IEEE 802.11 standard. The people who design protocols have some difficult tasks to get them correct, to make sure that they don't make mistakes when they design them, such that, for example, a situation where my laptop wants to send to the access point, but it's waiting for a response for the access point, and the access point is waiting for a response from my laptop. They get into some deadlock where neither of them will send because they're both waiting for a response from the other. 
So the protocols need to be designed such that that state doesn't occur. So they need to be correct. They need to perform well, usually. We often care about performance, like minimizing delay, maximizing throughput, and other metrics. And be secure. We do not cover security in this course, but uh, it's important that any communication protocol nowadays be designed such that people cannot extract information that they shouldn't ex be able to extract from that communication. We're not going to look at the techniques for ensuring correctness, maximizing performance or security. We're going to use a very simple technique to draw protocols and do some simple analysis of their performance. We'll call message sequence charts or time sequence diagrams. And I think we've seen one before, but we'll, I'll try and explain it uh, the type of diagram we'll use and we'll go through an example get you to use it. We need this because in the subsequent uh, discussion we're going to use them to illustrate the protocols. I think we will not go through that, we'll go straight to the example here. This is the type of diagram we'll commonly use to illustrate how a protocol works and then we'll use it in our course to analyze the performance like delay and throughput. So first let me explain what the diagram shows. This is what we we'll call a message sequence chart or a time sequence diagram. In this example there are two entities, two computers involved, A and B. The vertical line under A and B that indicates what's happening at computer A and this, the things that happen on this line indicate what's happening at computer B. Remember there are different endpoints of the link so they have different observation about what's happening when, when they communicate. What we want to show is the transfer of frames between A and B and the timing for the transfer of those frames. So the way that we'll draw it in this example, let's say, well first, for this vertical line, as we go down, time increases. Imagine we start our two computers and they're going to use some protocol to communicate and at the start we start a timer, a stopwatch. So the initial time is zero and the, time, the timer increases. Graphically, think if this time is zero, as we go down, the timer is increasing. So this will be greater than zero down here. So we're showing that the sequence of operations as time increases. In this example, let's say that at computer A, the human user has pressed a button, send. And that triggers the protocol to send a frame from A to B. How would we draw that? Well, when the user presses the button send at some time, say at this time, it triggers the protocol to start transmitting a frame. And the way that I'll draw the transmission of that frame is, is this rectangle here. So this rectangle means a frame is being transmitted from A and it's going to B during that period of time. The frame has a number of bits in it. It takes some time to transmit and you can calculate the transmission time by the data size divided by the data rate. So visually we'll say, right, we start transmitting here, after some time we'll end transmitting. So the time between this point and here is the transmission time of that frame. When A starts transmitting the frame, we can think that the signal representing the first bit of that frame comes out of that computer A and starts traveling across the link. And it propagates across the link and we know it takes time to propagate across the link. We can calculate the propagation delay. So when A transmits the first bit at this time, from the receiver B's perspective, some time later it's going to receive that first bit. So I show that if we transmit here, the reception will start at a lower point. 
and the difference in time will be the propagation time. The difference in time between this point and here is the propagation time of the link or the network. So we can think if A starts transmitting here, B starts receiving sometime later. And then B continuously receives the, the signal for that transmitter frame and eventually receives the last bit. And in the protocols we consider, B will not do anything with the frame until it's received it it's in the entirety. It must receive the full frame before it does anything with it. It's not always true, but in, in the simple cases we'll consider, we'll assume that B can't do anything with the frame until he has all bits of the frame. Once it has the entire frame, B may look at the frame, check if it has any errors, do some processing, and then use the data in there. For example, you use a, a computer A press send, it sent an email or a, f a frame containing the email to B. When B receives that entire frame, the data inside, the email is eventually displayed or, or sent, in, triggers a notification at the computer B's uh, application. So the data gets used once the frame is fully received and processed. So the point is we're going to use such diagrams to illustrate the exchange of messages. Here we just have one frame from A to B. But another protocol could have B sending a frame back in, in return. So we draw a rectangle being transmitted by B and it coming back to A. And once we have such diagrams, we can do some simple analysis of the delay. How long does it take from one point to another? And the throughput, we'll look at how many bits per second B can receive. So let's do that with an example. Uh, so you're, you're clear on what type of diagram. So I'll write down some characteristics for our link and our data and you'll draw a diagram. I want you to draw a diag diagram like this. You don't need to label the words in these dashed arrows, just the solid line for A and B and the frame being transferred. And in addition to drawing a diagram like this, in fact your diagram will look almost identical to this, I want you to label on there the times at which different events happen. Assuming we start at time zero. If this is time zero and I write a zero here, what is the time at this point? What is the time at this point? That's your task, so let me give you the, the link characteristics. Let's say for our case we have a link from A to B and the characteristics of that link it's a distance of two kilometers the data rate is one megabit per second and the transmission speed our signal speed we've often assumed the speed of light Let's make it a bit simpler. Instead of 3 by 10 to the power of 8, we'll have 2 by 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. This is the data rate of the link. This is the speed of the signal transmission. And this is the distance, the length of the, the link, 2 kilometers. And we want to send a frame. First, we'll focus on just a single frame from A to B. And the frame is made up of 20 bytes of header plus 1,000 bytes of payload. So given that information, I want you to draw the picture, and it's going to be the same as the one on the slide, but I also want you to label the times of when we start transmission, when we finish transmission, and when B receives the entire frame. At least three numbers you should label on the picture, and then we'll, we'll add some more frames to it. So just spend five minutes. You'll need to calculate transmission delay, 
propagation delay. We'll assume so far no processing delay, so you only need transmission and propagation, and then label them on your picture. So draw a diagram essentially identical to this one, but label here the start time, the tr end transmitting time, and the receive time. So in our example, we want to draw a picture which will look like this, but we want to also label the timing on that. So we need to know the transmission and propagation delay. Let's do the transmission delay first. And I'm going to, we'll have different types of frames later. This one is a frame that contains data. Let's give it the name data. Because some of our la examples later, we may have a different type of frame. So we'll refer to this one as a data frame. So the transmission time as the data frame. Data rate, uh, sorry, data size. 1,020 bytes, header plus payload, divided by the data rate, 1 megabit per second. 1,020, we have bytes and bits per second, so we should have the same when we do the division, so let's convert this to bits at the top. So 1,020 times 8 is 8,160 bits. So now we have 8,160 bits divided by 1 mega bits per second. Divided by 1 mega, we get 1 micro. And bits divided by bits per second become seconds. 8,160 microseconds. And the other thing we'll need to know is the propagation delay. From A to B, how long does it take? The distance, 2 kilometres, divided by our speed of transmission is 2 by 10 to the power of 8. Two thousand metres divided by 200 million, 2,000 divided by 200 is 10. We get 10 divided by 1 million, we get micro seconds again. So we have our propagation delay and our transmission delay and we've, we're assuming no processing delay here so we can use those numbers and we'll label the time on our uh, time sequence diagram. So we think at the start A starts transmitting a frame. So I'll draw that as a rectangle. This is the data transmission being transmitted. This rectangle is showing that. Uh, this is our data, our data frame. And I'll call it data frame number one because I'll tr transmit some more in a moment. But for now, it's just our first data frame. And let's assume our, we start our timer when we start transmitting. That's the first thing we do in this case. So I'll label this time as point is time zero. So the time in microseconds. Instead of writing zero microseconds, I'll leave off the, the microseconds, just write zero. So we start transmitting at time zero. It takes 8,160 microseconds to transmit. Therefore, we'll finish transmitting at this time, 8,160. So all we're doing here is drawing a rectangle, indicate this is a frame being transmitted. It's a data frame. And it started at zero, and it finished at 8,160 in microseconds. 
but that to get to B is the other thing we're concerned about. How long does it take until B receives that frame in its entirety? We can think if A starts transmitting at time zero, the signal comes out and then it propagates to B. It takes some time to propagate. The signal representing this is the first bit of our frame. Then we transmit the second bit out of computer A, the third bit and so on. So the signal representing the first bit transmitted propagates to B. If it was transmitted at time zero, it's going to arrive 10 microseconds later arrive at time 10. The, the timer we're using at both A and B is, is the same. Okay. So it arrives at time 10 at B. That's the first bit. But then it receives the second bit, the third bit. And I'll not draw lines for all of the bits. What we're usually interested in, when do we receive the last bit? When do we get the entire frame? Eight thousand one hundred and seventy. Not so hard, is it? If we transmit it at eight one six zero, it takes ten to propagate, so we get the entire frame at eight one seven zero. So that's what I mean by labelling our diagram with the timing. Not so hard in this case, but it can be useful when we want to consider uh, total delay to do something in a particular protocol and calculate throughput. Note that my picture is not to scale. Okay, that it's very hard to draw it to scale because this is 8,000, this is only 10, but I cannot do that. So uh, we label the times to, to make it clear uh, when different events occur. Start at time zero, start transmitting. Finish transmitting from A's perspective at 8160. B finishes receiving at 8170. Let's continue. Let's say A has an infinite supply of data to send to B. So what does it do next? A has more data to send. Well, from A's perspective, it's transmitting at time 0 to 8160. It finishes the first frame. It's got more data to send, so it will transmit a second frame. So we'll draw the second frame, and when the second frame is finished, it will send the third frame and just keep sending. A okay, very simple uh, scenario where it just continuously sends frames, all of the same size, to B. Let's draw uh, a few more frames and draw the timing on those frames. After A transmits or completes transmitting frame number one, again, let's assume there's no processing delay. It can immediately move on to frame number two, data two. When will it finish transmitting data frame two? If it starts at 8160, when does it finish? It's the same size frame as frame one. It's still 1,020 bytes. Same size, same data rate, therefore same transmission delay. So another 8160 microseconds. Just add on 8160. 16.320. the frame. Now here we're, we're, uh, 
we're not going to, well, we've got a line effectively showing the start of the transmission. When does the second frame arrive at B? If we start, if we transmit the last bit at 16320, then it arrives 10 microseconds later. 16330. And you'll see that it just continues that pattern of an extra 8160 each frame. We're not going to draw many. Data frame three, data frame four, and the timing an extra eight one six zero. Four eight zero from here to here, and then to transmit frame number four another eight one six zero. And if frame number three will finish transmitting at two four four eight zero, it takes ten to propagate, and the fourth frame arrives at three two five five zero. And we could keep going, but I think you see the pattern. From A's perspective, it's transmitting a frame every 8160 microseconds, and just keeps going. And from B's perspective, it's receiving a frame every 8160 microseconds. And that's something we're interested in, because that's an indicator of throughput. From B's perspective, it's doing nothing at time zero. So from at time zero, B is not receiving anything. It's sitting there waiting. But then at time 10, B starts receiving. It starts receiving the first frame. It receives it. It spent 8160 microseconds receiving. Maybe it does some processing, but we're assuming that it's zero here. Then it starts receiving the second frame, and it takes 8160 microseconds to receive the second, and the third and the fourth, and, and each subsequent frame. Let's make note of that and look at the rate at which we receive. B receives one frame in 8160 microseconds here. And then in this period, it's another frame received in the same period, same time, and so on. So let's look at now the rate at which we receive frames. We can say B receives one frame every 8160 microseconds. If we continuously transmit data from A, it would always be uh, one frame per 8160 microseconds. What we care about is the throughput. And the throughput we define as the rate at which B receives payload. Not the rate at which it receives frames, but the, the bits per second considering the payload only, not the header. So. B receives one frame every 8160 microseconds. One frame contains 1,000 bytes of payload, plus 20 bytes of header. So we can say B now receives 1,000 bytes of payload every 8160 microseconds. Payload is the actual data, the thing that the, the users are interested in.
from that we can determine the throughput. The rate at which we receive payload, 1000 bytes every 8160 microseconds. And you'll use your calculator to find out what that is. How many bits per second B is receiving payload at? Can anyone tell me the last three numbers? Uh, nine, five, nine, I remember the first three. Nine, five, nine, something, something, something. Eight thousand bits divided by eight thousand one hundred and sixty microseconds gives us someone with a calculator divided by eight one nine six zero. Okay. Uh, what? Not nine five nine. I remember the wrong number. Bad memory. Nine eight zero three nine two. Nine eight zero three nine two. bits per second. We can see now if A continuously transmits frames without any breaks, then B will continuously receive frames. One frame per 8,160 microseconds. Every frame contains a thousand bytes of payload, so that gives us our throughput of 980 1,392 bits per second. What was the data rate? Back to our original question, we had a data rate of 1 megabit per second. How efficient are we in using the link in delivering payload? about 0 0.98 or 98 percent. I have a link that allows me to send bits at 1 million bits per second. But in my frame I'm not just sending payload, I'm also sending header. So I actually have 20 bytes of header plus a thousand bytes of payload. So that gives me an efficiency of about 98 percent. About 98% of the time I'm sending payload, the other 2% of the time I'm sending header through the link. And from the user's perspective, we care about the payload being delivered. Of course we need to include the header because the protocol usually needs it to support the correct operation. But from the user's perspective, they're getting 98% efficiency, which is good. Now there are other ways to calculate that. If you look at, in this case, a thousand bytes out of 1,020, 1,000 bytes divided by 1,020 bytes, it's also 98 percent. It's the same uh, approach. But when we look at some later examples, we'll see that, it's not so, that we should use this approach to calculate throughput and efficiency, not just consider the, the payload and frame size. Any questions on the calculations for this very simple case? And, and the drawing of the picture. And I think since we're on, on uh, 
drawing these pictures and doing these calculations, what I'll do instead of explaining flow control right now, we'll leave that till next lecture, we'll go through another example of a slightly different protocol and see how they compare. And then the next lecture tomorrow morning will explain why we would have a different protocol. So in this case, the protocol was very simple. Just send frames. The protocol defined the frame size. We defined up front 1,000 bytes of payload, 20 bytes of header. But there was no exchange between A and B. A just sends data as fast as possible. That's not very common. Usually we'll see that there's some feedback from B. A sends some frames to B, and B may reply with some information, maybe indicating whether there was successful transfer or not. And we'll also see that B may reply to, to slow down A. So we'll go through an example, and without explaining the reasons yet why we'd send back a response, but we'll go through an example calculation where every time A sends a frame to B, B will send back a reply message. And the purpose of the reply message is just to tell A it can send a new frame. So this new protocol will be A transmits one frame. When B receives that frame, B will send back a special frame which we'll call an acknowledgement, an ACK. Think it's B receives a frame and sends back a short message saying thank you for that frame. I now expecting another one from you. And when A receives the acknowledgement, A can send the next frame onto B. When B receives the second data frame, it will send back an ACK. So instead of continuously sending data, A will have to wait for the acknowledgement to come back before it sends data frame two. And then wait for the acknowledgement for data frame two to come back before it can send three. Let's consider that protocol. I want you to draw a time sequence diagram for that protocol. And let's give you one more piece of information. Let's assume the ACK frame is 20 bytes. So we use the same values here. The data frame, still 8160 microseconds. Propagation delay is still 10 microseconds, but we'll add in some more. Let's assume that we have a second type of frame called an acknowledgement, an ACK. And this ACK frame doesn't contain any data, any payload. It's just something B sends back to A saying thank you. It's like A sends a, some data to B, B sends back a thank you message. Then A sends some more data, B sends back a thank you message, an acknowledgement. So it's in fact just 20 bytes in our example. In other, other examples, it will not necessarily be 20 bytes. It's just for this calculation. It's header only. No payload. What's the transmission time of our ACK frame now? Same data rate. We have just 20 bytes to transmit. We have 160 bits at 1 megabit per second, 160 microseconds. Our data frame was 8,160 bits. In fact, 160 bits were the header. Here we just have the header, no data. So it's 160 microseconds to transmit the ACK. What's the propagation delay from B to A? 
going in the opposite direction. From A to B, it was 10 microseconds. So from B back to A, it's also 10. Same distance, same speed, so same propagation delay. That's quite common. And the rules of our protocol, which are different from before, rule one, A waits for ACK before moving on to the next frame. we fit that in. And the second rule, in our case, just to summarize our protocol in this case, the rules are, A, after transmitting a frame, we will start by transmitting a frame. It will wait for an acknowledgement of that previous frame, and it will wait for, to receive the acknowledgement in its full before it will transmit the next frame. And from B's perspective, the receiver of the data, when B receives data, it will immediately send back an act. There may be different rules in different protocols, but that's what we'll consider today. And, well, maybe not immediately. Let's add in another thing. When B receives the data, it sends that back an act after one microsecond of processing, receive the data, process, then send back the ACK. We'll add in some processing time for this calculation. And that's just to illustrate that our timing diagram can capture different delays. Given that, draw our timing diagram and calculate uh, the total time to complete a single data transfer and then try and look at what happens if you send, try and draw say three data frames being sent from A to B. And then finally we'll look at the throughput. I'll let you try and draw the timing diagram first and then we'll calculate the throughput at the end. So A, we'll start by A transmitting the data at the start. It's going to be the same as our previous case. Start at time zero. It's eight one six zero. B receives or starts receiving at time ten. Finishes receiving at eight one. Eight one seven zero. This is the same as before. From A's perspective, it's transmitting the first data frame. It finishes. It's got more data to send. But in our protocol, the rule says we cannot send more, we cannot send the next one until we receive the act for the previous one. 
Tomorrow we'll talk about why you would do that, what's the benefit of doing it, but let's just look at the performance for now. So A, at this point, cannot do anything. It cannot transmit. It must wait. Wait for an act to come back. So let's look at B. B receives frame 1 at time 8170. Then we said there's some processing time. Hard to draw, but it's a small amount of processing here. And it only takes one microsecond, so the processing finishes at A171. Okay, so there's some processing time. We're not transmitting, we're not receiving, we're processing the previous frame. Then we send back a thank you message to A. I've just received the data. I send back an acknowledgement saying, thank you for the data, please send me more. We call that acknowledgement in short an ACK. And it should be smaller than the, the data. Now my, again the scale is not, it's not to scale but we can see the main idea. This is ACK. This is the first ACK we sent. How long does it take to transmit an ACK? we said 160 microseconds. So if we start at 8171, add on 160, it would finish at 8331. Is that right? Yeah. If we started transmitting at 8171, the propagation delay from B back to A is 10. So we'd start receiving the ACK at 8181 that's receiving the act, and we'd finish receiving at 8341. Now we don't have to always draw all of these times, especially when we start receiving. Sometimes that's not of interest. We care about when we get it uh, the last bit. Because we'll assume that we must get the entire frame, whether it's data frame or act frame, before we do anything with it. That's common. So this is the scenario we have for the first data frame. A transmits to B. B processes, sends back the acknowledgement. Once A has that first acknowledgement, it checks it, and now it can move on to the second data frame. So we get with the second frame being transmitted now. And when B receives that second frame, it's going to process for some time and then send back an ACK. So this is data frame two. This is act two, the second act. And the timing that we have here. Remember everything's the same in terms of frame size so and propagation delay, so it's again another 8160. So we add on 8160 and we get what? 1650. Yes. Why is there one microsecond delay here? Because in this, just in this example, I introduce a, a case where I said, B gets the frame. It's a slow computer. It needs to process. And let's say it takes one microsecond to process. I could have said five microseconds or 10 seconds, but just to introduce a different uh, time in here. And each frame will take one microsecond. What do we get? Add 160, uh, we get 5,001, 501. Right. 
running out of space. With one microsecond processing delay, then we transmit back. This is the one we care about when we finish. You can check the, the numbers in here, but if you look closely, if you look at the first frame, we started at zero, we ended at 8341. The next frame is exactly the same. That is, we do the same steps. So it's going to take the same time. And the difference between 8341 and our 16682 is 8341. So the time for each phase is the same in this case. This is a different protocol. The, the role of the protocol, the reason for sending the act, we'll discuss tomorrow. But for here, just see how we draw it and calculate the timing. You'll go home tonight and calculate the throughput in this case. Calculate the throughput and efficiency and tell me the answer tomorrow. <laughs>